Hello, and welcome to this video on primary research methods in sociology. A primary research method is one where the researcher collects data specifically for their study. They may go out and collect this data themselves or have research assistants do it for them. In this video, we will delve into the four main primary methods sociologists employ to investigate the complexities of human society. Specifically, we will scrutinize four pivotal methods, observations, interviews, questionnaires, and experiments. Each method plays a distinctive role in the sociological toolkit, offering researchers unique avenues to explore various facets of social life. Throughout this video, we will meticulously unravel the intricacies of each research method, elucidating how they are executed and their respective strengths and limitations. By comprehending the inner workings of these methods, you will gain a deeper insight into the foundations of sociological inquiry. Moreover, we will illustrate the practical utility of these methods by providing real-world examples of their application in sociological research. This contextualization will not only underscore the relevance of these techniques, but also demonstrate their potential to uncover profound insights into the dynamics of society. So, join me, Dr. Mawaski, on this intellectual journey as we explore primary research methods in sociology. In the realm of sociological research, observations provide us a special lens to peer into the intricacies of human behavior. Observations let us watch participants in their natural settings, which often provides rich and genuine data, enhancing the study's validity. But like every method, it's not without its pitfalls. We might deal with a small sample size or sometimes struggle with reliability issues. There are six variations of observation that fit together like a jigsaw. Covert or overt. Participant or non-participant. Structured or unstructured. It is like a pick and mix deciding which combination works best for that particular research. For example, using a structured, non-participant overt observation. Let's start with covert observation. It's a method where the individuals being observed aren't aware of it. Think of it as being a silent observer in the background. Remember Laud Humphrey's study in the 70s? The tea room trade. He discreetly observed men in public restrooms to delve into anonymous male to male encounters. And then, we have Hobbes' 1988 exploration on police attitudes. Here, he practically became a part of the police force to truly understand their world. Covert observation has its merits. It often captures genuine behavior since participants don't know they're being watched. Yet, it's not without ethical concerns. The idea of observing someone without their knowledge raises consent issues, and there's the potential for researcher bias. On the other hand, overt observation is essentially the opposite of covert. Here, participants are aware they're under scrutiny. Picture it like a documentary where subjects know they're on camera. Venkatesh's 2011 study, Gang Leader for a Day, is a prime example. He was upfront about his observation immersing himself in the gang's daily life. Similarly, in Hargreaves' 1967 study into setting and streaming and Eileen Barker's 1984 research into the Moonies, the participants knew they were part of the study. Overt observation has the advantage of directness and ethical transparency. But there's a hiccup. The mere act of observing can change the behavior of those being observed, which is called the Hawthorne effect. Participant observation is another fascinating approach. Here, researchers don't just watch, they take part, becoming an active part of the group they're studying, gaining what Weber referred to as Verstehen, Bill White's Street Corner Society, and Paul Willis's Learning to Labor. Both took this approach and were able to experience the group's dynamics firsthand. It offers a detailed inside look, but there's a catch. Researchers might become so engrossed that they lose their objective stance. This is referred to as going native. Shifting to non-participant observation, it's more of an onlooker's stance. For example, when Ofsted come into schools to complete an inspection. Another example is Atkinson's 1978 research into suicide. He didn't involve him directly in coroner inquests. He simply observed the inquest from the public gallery. This method minimizes interference, offering a detached perspective. But you might miss the insider's view, and there's the ever-present observer effect. 
structured observation is more methodical and preferred by the positivists. Think of it as having a checklist while you're observing. It brings uniformity to the table, making data comparison easier. But it might lack depth since it's focused on specific behaviors. Lastly, unstructured observation is like freestyle dancing, no fixed steps, just going with the flow. Researchers simply dive in and note whatever stands out which is why it is preferred by the interpretivist. It's flexible, potentially leading to unexpected discoveries. But it can be a bit daunting, and making sense of such vast and varied data can be challenging. Remember, each method has its place, and it's all about choosing the right approach for the research question at hand. The next primary method we're diving deep into is interviews. Interviews are tools we use to collect detailed information, usually through verbal questions. These can happen face-to-face, -face, but also over phone or video chat. Broadly, we categorize them into four main types, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, and group. Starting with the structured interview, it's much like following a script. Every participant is asked the same set of questions in an identical sequence. Think of studies like Halsey, Heath, and Ridges. Origins and Destinations, which sought to understand patterns of social mobility in England, specifically focusing on the educational and occupational transitions of individuals. Or Peter Townsend's Poverty and Social Exclusion, which looked at the broader understanding of poverty not just in terms of income or material deprivation but also in terms of social exclusion and the inability to participate in normal societal activities. The strength of this approach lies in its consistency, making it easier to compare and analyze responses. However, its rigidity can be a limitation. Participants might feel boxed in, and the interviewer may miss out on nuances or spontaneous insights. On to semi-structured interviews. This is where flexibility meets structure. While there's a set list of questions, interviewers can adapt, probing deeper based on responses. Dabash and Dobashes. Violence against wives. Anne and Oakley's. The sociology of housework. Exemplify this. The advantage here is adaptability. Researchers can explore unforeseen avenues during the interview. However, this flexibility can lead to inconsistencies across interviews and there's always a risk of interviewer bias influencing the conversation's direction. Unstructured interviews, as the name suggests, are quite open-ended. Without fixed questions, the conversation meanders based on participants' perspectives. Pat Carlin's Class and Gender Deals and Howard Becker's Teacher Labeling chose this method. It's unmatched in capturing rich, detailed insights, allowing for a deep dive into personal experiences. However, this depth can be a double-edged sword, it may not always be representative, and there's potential for off-topic diversions. Moreover, the lack of structure might make data analysis more challenging. Finally, group interviews. Multiple participants, one discussion. Paul Willis's Learning to Labor offers a glimpse into this method. This format's dynamism can reveal group dynamics and provide a broad spectrum of opinions in a short time. Yet, challenges arise when dominant participants overshadow quieter voices, potentially skewing data. Also, groupthink, a phenomenon where group members go along with the consensus rather than offering individual perspectives, might affect the authenticity of responses. To wrap up, interviews are a cornerstone of qualitative research. Their adaptability and depth are commendable. But, as with all tools, their effectiveness hinges on how adeptly they're employed. Always consider the goals of your research and the potential strengths and weaknesses of each interview type. The next method we are going to discuss are questionnaires. A questionnaire is essentially a set of structured questions crafted to gather specific pieces of information from those answering, and it is completed away from the researcher. For instance, you might have come across businesses trying to understand how satisfied you are with their service or product. In the realm of academia, 
health researchers might deploy questionnaires to understand our dietary patterns or how often we engage in physical activities. One of the main advantages of questionnaires is the ability to reach a large number of participants, offering a wider perspective. They're also cost-effective, straightforward to analyze, and they can offer participants anonymity, which can sometimes yield more honest responses. However, there are challenges, too. Participants might misinterpret questions or just randomly fill them without much thought. And, as much as we'd like to believe everyone, there's no guaranteed way to ensure every response is truthful. Like all research tools, it's the method and execution that truly counts. When constructing a questionnaire, we can use two types of questions, closed and open. Let's dive into each. First, we have closed questions. These provide respondents with a set of predefined answers. Think about those multiple-choice questions you encounter in quizzes. For example, a study might ask participants to choose their favorite fruit from options like apples, bananas, or grapes. Another popular type of closed question is the Likert scale, where participants are asked to indicate their level of agreement with a statement, such as, I enjoy studying history, and they respond using a scale from, strongly disagree, to, strongly agree. The strengths here are that closed questions are straightforward to analyze, and they offer clear, structured data. However, they don't allow for in-depth or varied responses, which can sometimes limit the richness of the data. On the other hand, open questions give respondents the freedom to answer in their own words. Imagine a study exploring reasons students enjoy a particular subject, with a question like, Why do you like studying English? Open questions can provide deeper insights and unexpected answers, which can be a goldmine for qualitative research. However, the flip side is they can be time-consuming to analyze, and the responses can vary widely in quality and depth. Once you have crafted the questions, but how do you get them to our participants? First up, we have web-based questionnaires. You've probably encountered these through online surveys or even school feedback forms. A classic example is a company seeking feedback on their website's user experience. The beauty of web-based questionnaires is their reach. You can get responses from people all over the world. They're also cost-effective and quick to distribute. However, they can sometimes be limiting, as they rely on participants having internet access, and response rates can vary. Then, we have the traditional postal method. It might sound a bit old-school, but it's still effective in certain scenarios. For instance, if your participants are elderly and may not have the skills to answer online questionnaires, Postal questionnaires can reach a diverse age group, including those not so tech-savvy. But they can be slower, more expensive, and rely on people filling out and mailing them back. Lastly, hand-delivered questionnaires. Think about a researcher going door-to-door in a neighborhood to collect feedback on a local issue. Teachers might hand out questionnaires to students for immediate feedback after a class activity in a school setting. Hand delivery ensures the targeted group receives the questionnaire which can sometimes yield higher response rates. However, it's labor-intensive and can be limited in reach. In essence, the delivery system you choose will heavily depend on the nature of your study and the audience you're aiming for. It's all about balancing cost, convenience, and coverage. Our last form of primary method is experiments. In much the same way that a scientist in a lab might test a hypothesis related to physics or chemistry, sociologists deploy experiments to delve deeper into human behaviors and social interactions. Consider this, our equivalent to the scientist's test tube might be a social setting, and where they have chemicals, we study people and their behaviors. Our overarching aim? To discern cause and effect relationships, offering insights into the intricate tapestry of our society. Moving on, let's hone in on a fundamental technique within sociological research the laboratory experiment. At its core, this method revolves around analyzing human behavior within a controlled setting. The objective is straightforward, alter one variable and observe its influence on another, thereby allowing for a clearer delineation of cause and effect. A compelling illustration of this is the 1963 Milgram study on obedience, where participants, under the belief they were administering electric shocks to another person, 
demonstrated the lengths they'd venture in submission to authority. Further, Harvey and Slayton's 1976 examination on teacher expectations and social class provided insights into the biases teachers might harbor based on students' perceived socioeconomic standing. However, it's worth noting that while laboratory experiments provide an unparalleled degree of control over variables, their artificial nature can sometimes cast doubts on the applicability of their findings to real-world scenarios. Yet, the revelations from such investigations are indispensable in shaping our comprehension of societal interactions. Now, moving on to the other form of experiments utilized by sociologists. The field experiment. Distinct from the aforementioned laboratory experiments, these are set against the backdrop of the real world. Here, even if a variable is manipulated, the environment remains untouched and authentic. A prime example would be Rosenthal, and Jacobson's 1966 Pygmalion in the Classroom. Teachers, under the false impression that certain students were poised for remarkable academic growth, inadvertently nurtured better performances from them, underlining the profound impact of self-fulfilling prophecies. While field experiments grant us a genuine window into natural human behaviors, they're not without their pitfalls, including the challenge of external variables and ethical concerns. Nevertheless, the lessons we draw from them are crucial, painting a richer picture of the multifaceted realm of human interactions. So, there you have it. We have covered the four main primary methods used in sociological research. Observations. Interviews. Questionnaires. And experiments. We have covered how they work, the different types and the strengths and limitations of using each method. You will revisit this as you go through each of the topics but this should provide you with a solid foundation. See you soon.